Welcome. Today's program is focusing on early recognition and management of sepsis patients in extended care facilities. Today's focus will be on why sepsis and what is sepsis. So today we will talk about the defining the sepsis incidence and impact, especially on the elderly, define the sepsis continuum, and then understand the pathophysiology of sepsis. My mother, a 20-year breast cancer survivor, she dies of a disease that we never even, never even heard of. Septic shock, sepsis, and she was like, how do you spell it? I said, I don't know. Really, does it affect that many people? Then why haven't I heard of it? My mother, Mama, she had plans of being a gospel singer. One glorious happy day. They found a clot in her femoral artery. She got through that surgery, but she started complaining of a lot of weakness, couldn't catch her breath. When I heard the word sepsis, I didn't understand it. I remember that I went to bed, woke up to find the EMTs in my room. My doctor friend called the hospital and said, look, unless somebody is coding, there's no one in there as sick as this man is right now. Get a doctor in there. In the next few hours, I had one shut down after another, all of my organs, lungs, kidneys, eventually a heart attack. My toes were blackened and gangrenous. It was very unclear as to whether I would survive. It was Halloween. He was up and crying and crying. I took his temperature, 102.3, and his color was gray. His lips, his everything was gray, and he was not responding. We got to the hospital. Um, he got swelled up, so he was huge. And one of the doctors said, we don't know if you'll be able to take him home. I'd been waiting for him for, for all these months, and I've only had him three weeks. He, he's mine. I wish I would have asked more, but I felt like I was supposed to know as a mother. I didn't understand that any infection could result in a toxic response that is known as sepsis. It started when I went to the dentist and had some dental work. Following that, I developed an infection and then septic shock. I can't even describe to you the horror of seeing her die of sepsis. The body swelling up twice its size, fingers turning black, having to be intubated. It looked like someone took a shotgun and shot her in the leg. That's what it looked like. For me, this could have a very different ending and it's why I share my survivor story. And the nurse, her name was Annie, and she says, are you ready to hold him? And I said, oh my God, yes. She put him in my arms. And she says, he's gonna be okay. I thought maybe if I share my story, you know, somebody will learn from it. Mama's gone, but maybe somebody else can be saved. There was an amazing video that you watched called The Faces of Sepsis that really brings it home to it's so important to recognize this disease early because it can significantly change people's lives. We saw in that video three testimonials. 
one, two survivors um, and one that didn't survive. Important to understand that we can make a difference by early recognition. So how prevalent is sepsis? Well, worldwide, it is one of the major causes of morbidity and mortality. It's the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. It's the leading cause of death in non-coronary ICUs. More than 750,000 new cases of severe sepsis occur every year. And most importantly, 500 patients die in the U.S. each year from sepsis. That's like two planes crashing every day with no survivors. There's been a significant rise in sepsis in U.S. hospitals. This report from 2009 tells us that over half of the hospitalizations for sepsis were in patients over the age of 65. We also know that you are more likely to be hospitalized for sepsis if you are older. So ages 65 and older are more likely to be hospitalized from sepsis versus being able to be cared for at home. Sepsis is responsible for a significant amount of readmissions to hospitals, readmissions from home, from patients that are home with home care, or readmission from extended care facilities. You can see here that sepsis and respiratory disorders, as well as UTI, all infections, account for about 34.5% of all readmissions. In Michigan in 2014, skilled nursing facility readmissions, if we look at the details, close to um, 47 percent of the readmissions from skilled nursing facilities to hospitals were related to sepsis or an infection. Sepsis significantly impacts the elderly. Age itself is an independent risk factor for death in, pa in patients with sepsis. More likely, they're more likely to be admitted to the ICU, and the highest mortality in sepsis resides in the older elderly, the patients that are 85 plus years. They often have prolonged hospitalizations. Beyond the immediate impact of sepsis, there's a post-sepsis impact called post ICU syndrome or post-hospital syndrome, and as a result of this illness, they can have cognitive deficits as well as functional deficits. So it, it can ex expedite some of their cognitive decline if they had already begun cognitive decline, and they are often more debilitated. We know sepsis is a time-sensitive disease, so our management of sepsis has to be in an urgent fashion. Similar to the diseases depicted on this slide, acute MI, stroke, and trauma are all time-sensitive illnesses and require immediate action to improve overall outcomes. With sepsis, we have to recognize it early and follow the evidence-based guidelines to intervene to improve overall outcomes for our patients. Sepsis sits on a continuum, and it's important to understand that any patient that has an infection can progress through that continuum to septic shock and then death. So you see here, to depicted on the slide that you first start off with an infection. So say you have a patient that has a cellulitis. They have a normal inf infection and that cellulitis is on their right thigh. What kind of things are you going to see to tell you that they have an infection there? You're going to see redness, you're going to see, feel warmth, you're going to see inflammation and swelling. Those are all normal physiological processes that the body has to begin to heal that infection. So locally, there's vasodilatation that brings increased blood supply to the area, increases the warmth. Locally, we also have increased capillary permeability that results in um, swelling in that area. 
the inflammatory response is revved up. And so those are all the symptoms we see and that physiology is happening locally. In sepsis, instead of just having a local response to a local infection, I now have a systemic response to that local infection. So my whole body is responding. So instead of just locally having leaky capillaries and vasodilatation and increased inflammation, that's happening throughout the body. So how do you know if your patient is having a systemic response to a local infection? You look for SIRS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So you look for a temperature in your patient greater than 38 or less than 36, a heart rate greater than 90, a respiratory rate greater than 20, white blood cell count greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000, or an increase in the um, differential baby uh, white blood cells called the bands. Um, also, the um, stress response is ignited in, in this population, and so you might see um, an increase in patients' blood sugar, especially in the non-diabetic, where you wouldn't expect an increase in blood sugar, and that's a blood glucose greater than 140. So if I have two or more of the SIRS, or that in, um, stress response with hyperglycemia, plus an infection, now I have sepsis. So sepsis plus two or more, infection plus two or more SIRS equals sepsis. The patient can continue to progress to severe sepsis where they now have an organ dysfunctioning. And that organ that dysfunction is dis, in a, a distant organ from where the infection is. So going back to our cellulitis patient. So you have skin infection and your cellulitis patient all of a sudden um, requires O2, so supplemental O2. Their oxygen saturation drops to 90 and it had been running 100 on room air. That is a different organ system that's now being impacted um, by the body's over-response to the infection. So when you're looking to find um, different organ systems that um, are dysfunctioning, you want to look at, we talked to the example of respiratory, someone having increased oxygen requirements or oxygen saturation less than 90. Cardiovascular, you're going to look for uh, hypotension, and that's a systolic blood pressure less than 90, or a 40 millimeter of mercury drop from their baseline. You're going to look for a low urine output, less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour that's sustained over a few hours or a bump up in creatinine to greater than two. Probably one of the earlier signs, and especially in our elderly, is a change in mental status. Subtle confusion, um, decreased level of consciousness, those are all important to remember. We also can see some metabolic changes, and we look for um, a lab test called lactate. Um, and if it's greater than two, that means my patient has uh, severe sepsis. If it's greater than four, the patient has septic shock. So we're looking for those organ systems uh, dysfunctioning in an organ that's distant from the infection. Sir William Osler said it correctly, except on a few occasions, the patient appears to die from the body's response to the infection rather than from the infection itself. So what's the pathophysiology of sepsis? We have an imbalance in homeostasis. We have too much coagulation going on, too much inflammation, and not enough fibrinolysis. So what's happening? This is a schematic of the endothelial membrane that lines all of our blood vessels. You can see neutrophils and the monocytes come in and to respond to that infection. The neutrophils cause the release of a bunch of cytokines that are responsible for the increased inflammatory response, the vasodilatation, and the increased capillary permeability. Together, the neutrophils and the monocyte cause the release of tissue factor that ignites the coagulation cascade. So now the patient is beginning to create lots of clots, microemboli. At the same time, fibrinolysis, the breaking down of those clots, is suppressed. So as a result of this, 
we end up having lots of microemboli, poor perfusion to our tissues, and the tissues don't get enough oxygen, and that's why they begin to dysfunction. This is a picture of the microcirculation um, of a patient, and it's under their tongue. And so on the right-hand side of this picture, you see the venial, and then on the left-hand side are the arterioles, and you can see nice little capillary loops. Very well perfused, um, good blood flow, good oxygen getting to the tissues. If you look at this slide, this is a patient with septic shock, and you no longer see good capillary flow. And it's because, you, and if you look really closely, you can see emboli in the blood vessels. And those microemboli have clotted off the capillaries, preventing oxygen from getting to the tissues, which results in our organ dysfunction. So that's what sepsis is, why it's so important to recognize it early. And once you've recognized it early, it's important to manage it. So we will be talking, the, there is another module that will focus on early identification and management of the patient with sepsis.